I'm also very pleased that I can address you and we can be together on the difficult conditions given the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want us to remember those we have lost in the diaspora, in New York, and here in Dan, to the dreaded COVID-19 pandemic. I'm aware that we would have lost some great souls in the diaspora. And to the families of those persons, to the members of the diaspora families, for those who have lost loved ones. I thank the International Center for Democracy for inviting me and other members of our government to participate in this town hall forum. On behalf of the government and people of Ban, I acknowledge and express our appreciation for the sterling watchdog role and advocacy of the IC and others in the diaspora in defending our people's democratic rights. I recall that this event was most rigorous during the elections impasse from March 2nd to August 2nd, 2020. But it did not begin there. Even prior to the elections, the ICD was in the vanguard of advocating for a constitutional rule. Indeed, on the heels of the passage of the No Confidence Motion in December 2018, the ICD was most vocal in demanding respect for constitutionalism. They issued a statement which urged the then APNU AFC government to respect the process and to ensure that the Constitution was honored. They also lent his voice to the call for a smooth and sure path to elections within the time frame specified by the Constitution. Regretfully, elections were not held until 16 months later. Attempts to subvert the tabulation of the results of those elections lay siege to the democratic process and resulted in a protracted impasse during which the will of the Guyanese people was held hostage. I wish, in this regard, to commend the efforts of forces at home and in diaspora who stood their ground and demanded the respect of the will of the electorate. The ICD was in the forefront of the diaspora's plan in the diaspora, such as the ICD. It was a vigilance of democratic lobbying forces, their outspoken and principled stance, and their robust and sterling advocacy, which allowed democracy to survive the brutal attempt at its suppression. Any assault on free and fair elections represents an attack on democracy and must never be allowed. As the CCJ observed in its ruling in July 2020, and I quote, elections that are free, fair, transparent, and accountable are the lifeblood of a true democracy, end of quote. Democracy is not perfect, but it remains the best known system of government. Diana is attempting to perfect not convert this democratic value. We are strengthening our democracy by moving towards a more inclusive system of governance, a more transparent system of governance, and a more open form of governance. Our vision for our country is founded on democratic values and norms. Tonight, I want to speak to you about the Diana which we want and to which our efforts are being directed. Our vision was articulated in our manifesto, which stated, we all want a society which is free, prosperous, 
socially just, globally competitive, and which serves every Guyanese epithet. Every Guyanese must have a chance for a good education, access to good paying jobs, be able to start their own businesses, raise and provide for a family, own their own homes, live in a safe and secure environment, and retire with dignity. Every night must have full access to quality health care, safe water, be able to participate in sports and recreation, and freely practice the religion and culture. We believe our hard work and sacrifice, bolstered by the economy spent by oil and gas, by the oil and gas sector, must guarantee the next generation of Guyanese a brighter and better future. This is the Guyana that we want and that which is being constructed. This is a vision to which I set myself as your president and to which I will devote my every energy. In my inauguration address, I promise that I will be president for all of them. Those who voted for me and those who did not cast their ballot in my favor. I committed to serving every Guyanese with affection and fairness and devoid of discrimination. I also affirm the promise to institute a system of inclusionary dominance. Over the past 10 months, we've been implementing that system. My government will strengthen inclusion at three levels. At the level of the National Assembly, at the political level, and at the level of government. The adversarial character of the National Assembly does not preclude compromise or consensus. The two sides of our National Assembly may not always agree, but can still seek a common understanding, including through the utilization of parliamentary mechanisms such as the select committees. At the political level, I've held meetings with other political parties, including non-parliamentary parties. I'm not, of course, to meeting the main parliamentary opposition. However, this designation of my government as a legitimate presents practical obstacles to any such engagement. The parliamentary opposition must understand. They have to respect the will of the people. They have to honor the will of the people. And respecting and honoring the will of the people, they have to respect the government of the day that was elected by the people of the country. The third level of inclusion will be at the level of the government. We have already begun to involve in the management of our country persons who we feel have the experience and expertise required and who are committed to the national interests. I've also met with social and religious organizations, trade unions, and the private sector. I will continue to meet with them so as to benefit from their insights to learn more about their concerns. The Guyana you want is one that is united or avoid addressing the turning issues of race and inequality. I believe that yes, we have to deal frontally with these issues. Wherever it exists, we have to take steps to overcome our racial, perceived or not, divisions by openly or respectfully deliberating on what needs to be done and how. 
They soon to be established what they are in relation to. We mandated to leave this exercise, which is aimed at cementing our society, sealing and opening up opportunities that will help us to address the vision and solidify our common commitment to national unity. The work of the Commission will extend beyond our country's geographic borders. It will reach out to you, the members of the diaspora, because I am aware of the potential that lies in the diaspora. I am aware of how integrated our diaspora is with the development of our country. So we must benefit from the great asset, our human resource asset, the diaspora. So your input must find a way to further contribute to Canada's development. Inequality is another bugbear from which we are not sure. The Guyana want has to be one in which inequality is reduced and which will see the eventual eradication of poverty and the creation of a society that is socially just and more equal. The Guyana want is one that is economically prosperous and which generates increasing wealth and distributes that wealth in a manner that allows for improvements in citizens' living standards and the building of economic resilience. Never again must our people have to return to the dreaded ways of hyperinflation, economic recession, rapid depreciation of our currency, rationing of foreign exchange, the loss of credit, credit worthiness, contraction of business, loss of jobs, and bare shelves in our supermarkets. The Guyana we want must possess an economy that is more diversified and resilient. This is our surest bet against internal economic setbacks and the adverse effects of ex external market volatilities. Economic diversification will involve emphasis on the expansion of our manufacturing services sector. As we diversify, we'll also be in the traditional sectors, rice, sugar, bauxite, gold mining, timber, and fisheries, along the bedrock of our economy. These sectors still employ large numbers of Guyanese, contribute to economic growth, and are substantial foreign exchange. The sugar industry is being resuscitated. The burdens of the mining sector are being relieved. Rice production will be expanded and timber and fisheries will be revitalized. Oil and gas is now an important fulcrum of the economy, but will avoid extreme dependence on the sector so as to escape the clutches of the dust disease and the resource curse. The economy work will be modernized. In this regard, my government is persuaded a national transformative agenda, including the areas of energy and infrastructure. The country's transportation network is being dramatically improved, so as to improve connectivity, for example. We have commenced work on a bypass for drink between Diamond and Ogle, with connections to Mongo Echoes and Pompeyettes. This will be a new superhighway. We're developing a 
the short project will generate at least 250 megawatts of electricity of natural gas and slash energy costs by more than half. This will be a major boost to industrialization and in preparation for this development, a gas utilization master plan is being developed to link the gas to shore project to industrial development. Ghana will also be pursuing renewable energy projects, utilizing a mix of energy sources, including hydropower, solar, and wind. Our plan is to generate some 400 megawatts of newly installed capacity from renewable energy for residential, commercial, and industrial use. Our national transformative agenda also involves expansion of information communication technology and boosting tourism and manufacturing, which are aimed at becoming new economic growth poles. The Guyana we want will ensure people-centered development with emphasis on enhancing the quality of life of every Guyana through investments in social services, housing, health, education, and social security. Within the next five years, we aim to provide 50,000 new house lots to meet the growing demand for housing and to ensure that every family can have the opportunity to own its own home. We are building a 21st century education system to generate highly skilled Guyanese for economic modernization. He is committed to providing 20,000 online scholarships, reducing disparities between the regions of the country in the delivery of education, expanding the use of ICT in delivery of education, and offering eventually free education at the University of Guyana. The Guyana we want will be one that will have ever improving primary and preventive health care. Our short term goal is to ensure that every regional hospital is equipped to provide diagnostic services like x rays, computerized tomography, scans, CT scans, ultrasound scans, and echocardiograms. In the region of the long term, we intend to guarantee world-class health services, including specialty health services. Our social agenda will provide greater support and protection to our women. Women's empowerment through their participation in government and public administration has already begun. My government will facilitate the establishment of more daycare centers for working women and will support women entrepreneurs with microfinancing for income generating projects. We have pledged to presently increase old age pensions and social assistance. By 2025, the old age pension benefit would have increased to 40000 per month. We will also implement training programs to benefit the disabled. We will also ensure a greater role for young people in the country's decision-making process. As I noted in my inaugural address to the 12th Parliament of Ghana, our Amerindian brothers and sisters are forest people and deserve our utmost respect and honor. They determine to empower and improve their lives. In consultation with our indigenous people, we propose to update the Amendment Act. We will also be upgrading their health, housing, education, and the infrastructural development of their communities while preserving their rich cultural traditions. Sport and recreation are vital the citizens' well-being. We have begun to address the deterioration 
and neglect of our country's sporting facilities, and to provide great opportunities for sportsmen and sportswomen. I could go on, but I know we have a roster of speakers. I know we have our Attorney General here, who will elaborate on the many other areas. We want the land in which democracy is entrenched and healthy, where the rule of law and the rights of our citizens are respected. We want the land that is more equal and in which we celebrate our diversity, where our people live in harmony. We want the Ghana with a growing and resilient economy, which provides employment and income so that our people can enjoy a good standard of living. We want the Ghana in which people can own their own homes and live in safe and secure communities while enjoying quality social services and adequate social protection. This is the Ghana we want. And this is the land with your fashion. I just want to give you a few highlights. In just one year, we have restored confidence in the Ghana economy. We have restored confidence in our democracy. Only a few hours ago, I was at the soft turning event of what will be our second Marriott Hotel in Diana, the courtyard by Marriott. In just 10 months, we have started construction of two new hotels, the courtyard by Marriott and Aden by Western. Additionally, Three more international brands are embarked to commence before the end of this year. Board 40 project has been approved for manufacturing and fabrication, cement and asphalt plant. You see a new build plant, the completion of a 20 million US dollars. To spread corn and soil production to meet the full needs of our poultry sector. All of this are investments that will be made by the private sector of our country, here and in diaspora, in just 10 months. The continents in our economy, and you will, you will notice, I am not only speaking about oil and gas, the confidence in, of, in our economy in just 10 months, in a COVID environment, has seen increased growth in agriculture, manufacturing, mining, construction, wholesale, and retail. In this COVID environment, where we are also managing a horrible flood that has affected the lives of tens of thousands of our brothers and sisters. In which we have to deal with post-election history. I'm happy to report to you that our revenue target at the first half of this year has surpassed its projection by $11.3 billion as a result of the investment. We have seen a 100% improvement in our balance of payment. 100% improvement of our balance of payment deficit. We have been able to stabilize our reserve holding. We have been able to stabilize our public debt to a sustainable 
level. level. You have seen great improvement in the labor market, an increase in government transfers that will see social goods being given to the people of our country. And more importantly, we have removed in an annualized manner more than $50 billion of the tax burden that was imposed by the former government on the people of our country. By the removal and reversal of those taxes, we have put back in the pockets of ordinary diamonds more than fifty billion dollars annually. We have restarted tremendous investment in DNI. We are going to build two new part of market access road in region six that will see the opening up of thousands of acres of agricultural land. We're supporting our fish and folk in aquaculture. And we're supporting investment in large-scale agriculture. We have started our scholarship program. Very soon, the first batch of scholarship which will be close to 5,000 will be awarded to Chinese living here. We have already commenced work that will see 30,000 people that also having solar panels that will give them electricity for the first time in their life. In order to ensure our children stay in a learning environment during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have invested more than $4 billion in online learning and community training, printing of educational materials so that they will stay in a learning environment. We have commenced in just 10 months the construction of 28 new schools all across our country. So my dear brothers and sisters, I'm pleased to tell you that we have started this journey and we intend to work every single day harder than the previous day to realize the dream of all of us. That is a better, more prosperous, and fulfilling that. May God bless all of you. And please continue to be with you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to show our president how much we support you're doing. Can we stand, please? Stand up. Stand up, guys. Stand up. He thank you very much. It's very important for, for them to see that we have 10 persons outside, but 200 people inside. Once again, I want to say thank you to His Excellency, the President of Guyana, Mohammed Irfan Ali.
Stand up, guys. Stand up. Stand up. And that is what a president is supposed to be and supposed to do. That is why he was elected and the other was rejected. We know that you came here to hear His Excellency, of course, and he is still following us via the video. But we have our much loved, our star boy, Attorney General, bright boy for their, their former Attorney General, and he's here in the midst right now. I know that you guys are excited to hear him, so without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome to the stage Guyana's Attorney General, your son, Mr. Anil Nanlal. Hello, His Excellency President Dr. Muhammad Irfan Ali, Executive Members of the ICD, Respected Elders, Distinguished Gentlemen and Ladies, Brothers and Sisters. It is a privilege as well as it is humbling for me to be here and be afforded an opportunity to speak and to commingle with so many wonderful people. And I want to thank the organizers of this event for making it possible. I want to reiterate the gratitude to, that the President spoke about to all of you for the role that you played, for the support that you gave us, and the support that you gave Guyana during the elections period as well as the five months that ensued. We in Guyana drew strength. We drew inspiration. We drew energy. And we were invigorated by your love by your affection and by your show of support in so many facets and so many different ways. Your, the role that you played on the social media alone inspired us to keep going and to keep going and to keep going. And we must always remember these events because as human beings, we have to learn from our mistakes and the mistakes of the past. 
what you saw unfolding there was a grand, complicated, well-organized attempt to destroy Guyana. It may have owed its genesis to a political contestation in the form of an election. But it was much more grave and much more devastating than that. What you were fighting for and what we were fighting for was not political power, was not merely government. We were fighting to save a nation state that was on the precipice of destruction. And for the role that you played, Guyana as a country and all its people owe you an eternal debt of gratitude. Were we, and when I say we, I include you, were we not vigilant? Were we not focused? If we didn't have the proper leadership, then we could have easily lost that battle. Many, many, many people who did not enjoy the limelight played a crucial and critical role in that process. The process did not start on March the 2nd. The process started with the unconstitutional and unilateral imposition of a chairman of GCOM in the form of James Patterson. That is when the seed was planted. And the plan was that that gentleman would have spearheaded GCOM and GCOM would have been used as the machinery to steal the elections. And when the case was filed, when the case was filed, the plan began to unravel. Somehow, those who schemed and conspired to come up with this plan did not take into effect that during the 21 years or 23 years of the PPP in government, we had built a sound foundation for dem dem democracy and the rule of law, and we had in place institutions that would have protected Guyana from the type of penetration that they wanted. They did not take that into account. So they never had in their mind a place called the Caribbean Court of Justice. Recall one of the things that Burnham did was to remove all appeals to Her Majesty's Privy Council and to abolish that court from the Guyana legal system. And then to show you and to show the Guyanese that he controlled the judiciary after he removed fluid in the compound of the Court of Appeal building, which was then the apex of the judiciary. Do you know what that symbolizes? Do you know the symbolism of that? He was telling you, the people, that he is the leader of the PNC. And you can't do anything. You can't even go to court when he takes away your rights and he takes away your freedom because he controls the courts as well. And one of the things that we did 
was as soon as the Caribbean Court of Justice was established, Guyana was one of the first territory in the Caribbean to sign on. And the CCJ is one of the institutions that saved the democracy in Guyana. But they didn't stop there. When the C Before the CCJ ruled, Patterson began to implement their plan. So they wanted to do a house-to-house -house registration. And through that mechanism, they wanted to create a new list and throw away the existing voting register. And through that exercise, they would have refused to put on the voters list, on the national register, tens of thousands of persons whom they think would have voted for the PPP. And they wanted also, and we had to go to the court. And the Chief Justice ruled in accordance with the Constitution that once you are a citizen and you are 18 years and over, you are eligible to be registered. And once registered, your name cannot be removed from the list unless you are dead. They didn't think it out. So we were able to stop that unlawful exercise. And then in the middle of all of that came the no confidence motion. And when the no confidence motion was passed and they refused to obey the command of the resolution produced by that no confidence motion, which mandated them to resign as a cabinet within three months unless extended by the parliament, and they refused to comply with those constitutional prescriptions, the world started to look at Guyana, and the limelight began to shine on Guyana. And when that happened, it became more and more difficult for them to do the jiggery pokery that they wanted to do to win the elections. So while they were in government illegally, they couldn't implement the plan to rig. Recall, they had already <clears throat> ordered 500,000 birth certificates or some number like that. I can't remember the exact number. That was to be part and parcel of the rigging machinery. They would have fabricated Guyanese, fabricated voters. But the, the no confidence motion and the removal of Patterson thwarted all of that. And then the international pressure began to be built. And every day, a different organization was coming out with a statement calling on Granger to resign as a cabinet and to comply with the Constitution and fix a date for elections. And you here play that significant role of doing a lot of things here with the American government in addition to your public postings and the press statements that the president spoke about. So it was an effort emanating from various directions. So when the blows started to hit them, they didn't even know where the blows were coming from. And Granger eventually had to agree to issue the proclamation declaring March 2nd as the election date. But they did not give up. 
They, they then activated another component of their plan, which was Lowenfield et al. And then Lowenfield started to unfold another plan. So every day was a different issue. They didn't want to hold the verification exercise, which is required by law, what is called the claims and objections. And then they started to make allegations that hundreds of people were dead. Sun Sunday, just Sunday last, I went to Marakobai, which is an Amerindian village located 96 miles up the Maikodi River. And I, were, I was explaining to the people and reminding them because the people are very educated and they were following all events. The AP in that community claiming that they were dead. We had to take a GCOM team 96 miles up the river and produce the people and say, look, this is the man that you say is dead. <laughs> and we had to do that at various places across the country. Various places. When we finished that battle, then we had another battle. They start to look at PPP strongholds and give us insufficient number of polling places. So on the east coast of the Amarara, for example, a place like Monrepo, solid PPP area, where you have about eight to 10,000 voters, we had one voting place. And in Georgetown, you had voting place, voting places, knocking dog. <laughs> we had to go night night. The president himself, obviously he was not president then. Myself and other party leaders, we had to go into the villages in the night to take GCOM staff to show them where they were locating these polling stations and the geographic expanse that people had to walk to go and cast their vote. Whereas when you compare it to other areas, the voting stations were in excess. And also, they put certain PPP voters to go and vote in AP and new strongholds. They mix up the whole polling station, very well thought out plan. And we had to go and take the press and expose to us, people would go home, people would get fed up and so on. But we managed to get a number of new voting places. And then of course, and that was just a couple days, two or three days before the elections and the people in the communities don't know where they have to vote. That was a level of confusion that they were perpetuating against, against, against the system. Then we had elections day. And then you know very well that after voting concluded, they claimed that they won. You remember there's a video when Basil Williams said his statement of claim. <laughs> Not the statements of poll. He said, he said he got all the statements of claim. <laughs> so, and then the thing happened at Ashman Building that you all saw. You all saw with your eyes. Nobody told you. And I often said that these people, I don't know if it is genius or it is stupidity. But you can't thief a government in a glass room. The wall of the room are glass. The, all the ambassadors them looking into the room. 
Oh, see one card board wall for Putna. If you got to one team the election. Put one ten test wall. The thing is glass and we are looking in and we are seeing. And you know the whole fiasco about Mingo collapsing, etc. I left the voting place, the same place. I asked Mingo. I said, Mr. Returning Officer, are we working whole night or would we stop at some point in time? I had to know that because we had to have replacement scrutineers for our party in the exercise and the other parties too. If you're working right through, we have to work out a shift system because you're working whole night and whole day. The man told me, Mr. Nandlal, you are an experienced man. You know that when I start this process, I cannot stop it. <laughs> and I said, thank you, sir. And the party put in place a, a replacement to take place at 10, 12 midnight. I was speaking to Mingo there at about 7 p.m. I live about 10 minutes or less from that place. By the time I reach home, I get a call that Mingo stopped the process and says he will resume next day. The next day at 9, he said he will resume. At 9, we can't find him. At about 11 to 12, he comes down in a wheelchair, twists up all the mouth and the jaw hanging on one side. And they got through with the nose, he breathed. A magical transformation. And they rush him to the hospital. And that was all part of the saga, which you all know so well. A well opportunity to say that we had a legal team and we had a lot of support staff. Sometimes we don't recognize them for the role that they played. It was not a one-man show. It was a team. And we had to work and we had to fight every challenge at every step of the way. And you know the story too well. And then, of course, when we went to the recount, and then I don't have to go through the whole ordeal. You know it. It's fresh in your minds. But I just highlight a couple pieces so that you appreciate that the democracy that we have can become elusive and we can lose it unless we continue to be vigilant and we continue to guard it zealously and jealously. And that is why we promised electoral reforms and, and let me say, Guyana has a unique issue. All over the world, you have elements of voters' fraud, but it comes from the voters. In Guyana, you have a radically different situation. You have those who are in charge of the machinery who are attempting to machinery. No part of the world that you find that. So what we have promised is to look at the legislation, remove discretion as far as possible, make it clear wherever it is felt that it is ambiguous and unequivocal.